Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the best-selling author, award-winning international speaker, industry-leading salesperson, and a remarkable survivor, Christine Clifford Beckwith. I want you all to go back in time to the year 1971 and try to imagine the dwelling in which you were living at the time that had a television set. A commercial came on the air. This commercial, the single most significant sales and marketing event of your lifetime. Because it is from this commercial that can teach you or remind you three-fourths of what you need to know to market and sell donor services. I'm going to play the role of the narrator of this commercial, and one of you is going to play the other role. But don't worry, when the time comes, you'll know exactly what to say. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight we are at the fabulous New York dining spot, Lutece, where the diners have just finished their meal, and they're now having a cup of coffee. But what the diners don't realize is that the coffee they are drinking is Folgers Crystals. I see one of the diners finishing their meal right now. Let me go over and ask him about his experience. Hi, and your name is? Julio. Julio, and Julio, where are you from? New Jersey. Julio is from New Jersey, and Julio, welcome to La Tess. Thank you. And, and Julio, I see that you have just finished your coffee. Yes. yes. And how was it, Julio? Uh, good. Julio, the answer is fabulous. Oh, fabulous. Yes, fabulous. <laughs> fabulous. Now, why would Julio from New Jersey believe that freeze-dried coffee tastes fabulous? And by the way, for those of you who don't know this already, it doesn't. <laughs> but why would Julio from New Jersey believe that it does? There are three reasons of enormous significance as to why people will choose your services. So what is the first reason? Let's imagine that tonight, Julio and Steve and Chris Fisher and Dell and Jeffrey and I decide to go out after dinner to the most expensive restaurant in Minneapolis for coffee and dessert. So tonight we go to La Belle V and they bring the menus and we soon see that we can have either the coffee or the dessert, but at these prices, unless we take out a second mortgage, we're going to have to choose. <laughs> so we choose the coffee and they bring it to us and it tastes fabulous. Well, of course, it tastes fabulous. Show of hands here. Have any of you ever experienced a bad $13 cup of coffee? <laughs> your prices and fees are not just your prices and fees. They are the communicators and conveyors as to the quality of your service. And the higher the price, the higher the perceived quality. What is the second reason? why Julio believes that freeze-dried coffee tastes fabulous, even though it doesn't. Well, I think you can get a clue just by looking at Julio. He's a bon vivant, a gourmet, <laughs> a lover of great things. He subscribes to Gourmet Magazine and Bon Appetit in town and country. And for years, Julio has only read about brand name restaurants like Lutes, and he has only dreamed about eating there one day. And here he finds himself at Lutes, and he had read that the restaurant was fabulous, and so they bring the coffee, and it tastes fabulous, even though it doesn't. Why? Because it's not the coffee that Julio is experiencing. It's what the brand has convinced him he will experience. Brands change people's perceptions about you. Brands attract people, but they do even more than that. They change your experience, and they allow people to become long-term customers. And for the power of the story of brand, we need to look no further than extra strength Rogaine. <laughs> My husband was in San Francisco. He was reading the San Francisco Chronicle, and he came across an ad that simply stated, hair loss. My husband has an ego, just like most of us, so he pushed the 
hair back off his forehead, looked in the mirror and thought, yeah, I could use some. So he wandered the, down the street to the clinic. It was just down the street from his hotel. And he walked through the door. And the woman behind the counter said, are you here today responding to the ad in today's Chronicle? Yes, I am. Harry Beckwith, he said. Well, Mr. Beckwith, you're in luck. We just happen to be one of the only clinics doing the market testing for a brand soon to be called Extra Strength Rogaine. Mr. Beckwith, here's what we'd like you to do. We'd like you to take this vial of liquid home with you, rub it into your scalp every night 45 minutes before you go to bed, do that for 21 days, and then on the 21st day, call us and tell us about your hair gain. So my husband brought this stuff home, and he rubbed it into his head. And on the 21st day, I will never get over the commotion coming out of our bathroom. I've grown more hair. Honey, this is amazing. No. What's amazing is what happens next. My husband decides he's going to call the clinic out in California and order more bottles of this stuff. So he dials the number. He gets on the phone. He goes, Hi, this is Mr. Beckwith from Minneapolis, and it's my 21st day, and I've actually grown more hair. This is fantastic, and, and what? Oh, 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 okay. The woman on the other end of the phone asked him for his uh, case study number. So he gets back on the phone, and he goes, yeah, my, my number, 50765. And, yeah, and this is just so fun. I, I can't wait. I want to order some for all my friends. And the woman on the phone says, Mr. Beckwith, yeah? I've got some news for you. Yeah? You're in the control group. <laughs> now, I mentioned to all of you that my husband is not a quick learner, but he did take psychology and sociology in college. So he knew what a control group was. <laughs> and I could tell that at that very moment in time, he was in total denial. <laughs> and so my husband said, OK, so what exactly does that mean? And the woman says, well, Mr. Beckwith, what that means is that the stuff that was in your vial is Puritan vegetable oil and water. <laughs> now, I can tell that the woman on the other end of the phone is used to dealing with people like my husband. So she says, Mr. Beckwith, if it's any consolation to you, don't worry. 40% of the people who were in the control group reported hair gain. We always get these numbers when we do these studies. And so then my husband has to ask the question, well, then what percent of the people who used the real stuff grew hair? 60%, she says. So at this point in my program, I'm going to stop and offer you the only unsolicited non-marketing and sales piece of advice that I will offer all day. And that is women or men interested in growing hair, just go buy some Puritan vegetable oil and water. <laughs> Because see, all we really want to do is feel better about ourselves. We want to change our experience. And besides, if it doesn't work, then you've got extra ingredients left over for salad dressing. You've kind of amortized your costs. So let's go back to Julio one last time and ask, what's the third reason that Julio believes that freeze-dried coffee tastes fabulous, even if it doesn't? Well, it's amazing. You can go anywhere in the world, and if you are served freeze-dried coffee in fine bone china over Irish linens while listening to Bocelli play on a $350,000 stereo system, an amazing thing happens to your perception of the coffee. It tastes fabulous, even if it doesn't. Why? because we think with our eyes. And for the power of packaging, which becomes the third reason, we need to go back to the city of Garland, Texas, eight years ago this past April. A woman brought her seal point Siamese cat into her veterinarian for what she thought were going to be routine inoculations, or what she hoped would be routine inoculations. Upon examination, her veterinarian noticed that something was slightly off about the cat, its balance. Fearing that the cat might have a tumor and that it might be malignant and that might 
might be what was causing the lack of balance. The veterinarian ran his fingers up each of the cat's legs and then up its back and spine and then up its neck to a tiny place behind each of its ears where behind the right ear he found a tiny pebble no bigger than a grain of sand on the shores of Lake Minnetonka. He asked and received the woman's permission to lance and biopsy the lump, and it was malignant. He had saved the cat's life. It was an extraordinary act of professional skill and competency, the kind of skill and competency we all aspire to every day in our own lives. So on that day, as the woman exited VetSmart, we interviewed her as we had done 400,000 other people. And we asked that woman on a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being the highest level of professional skill and competency, how would you rate your veterinarian for his performance that day? She gave him a 7. Why? Because we think with our eyes. That day, her veterinarian was wearing a Brooks Brothers shirt, a pair of Levi Dockers nicely pressed, a pair of Bass Weijin loafers all shined and clean. And our exit surveys have showed us that if a veterinarian wears a blue lab coat to work that day, his average rating will be 6.62. If he wears a white lab coat to, day, to work that day, 7.35, and if he wears a white lab coat and a stethoscope to work that day, his average rating, 8.82, almost two full points higher, because it's all in what we wear. In fact, many of you, especially the women, may know this to be true, handsome veterinarians score even better. <laughs> In fact, I was telling the story once in Atlanta, Georgia, and a woman was sitting right about where you are, and your name again was Gina. Gina. And I could see this woman turn the brightest shade of Georgia red that I had ever seen. And I could see her thinking to herself, why, why Mrs. Clifford Beckwith is right. You know, when Dr. Hamilton takes my fluffy into his big hands and brings her up to my chest, why? Well, well, I think I got the vapors. <laughs> it's all in how we see things because we think with our eyes. And so now we come to the fourth key. It's the trump key that can over-trump them all. I was a senior in high school back in San Marino, California, in Southern California, and the hit singer of my day was a woman named Laura Nero. She had an, uh, an album that came out that year called Eli and the 13th Confession, and some of the songs on that album were Bill, Wedding Bell Blues, Stone Soul Picnic, and then, as you might imagine from the name of her album, Eli is Coming. I heard that Laura Nero was coming to Stanford University's Memorial Auditorium to play a concert. So on the day of the concert, my friends and I loaded ourselves into my family's station wagon, and up the coast we drove. And that night, we rushed into Memorial Auditorium, and we took our place in the fourth row. And the curtain opened, and Laura Nero was sitting there behind a Steinway grand piano. And she waited for about seven minutes until the applause and the screaming and yelling died down. And then this is what she said. Uh, I'm going to play a song <clears throat> off my album, and some of you may be familiar with it, and I think George might have helped me write that. Bill, I love you so, I always will. Of course, she sang it better than that, but uh, she finished the song, and then when she was finished, uh, that's a song off my album, and as I said, I, I think George helped me write that song. Well, this concert went on like this for about 90 minutes. It was a concert that we realized had been conducted entirely through the miracle of peripheral vision. <laughs> she never once looked us in the eye. 
She never once made us feel grateful that we had come. Laura Nero failed to recognize the difference between a product and a service. We could buy her products. We knew her albums were great. But you feel about a service the way you feel about the person providing the service. Eyeball to eyeball, heart to heart, face to face. You feel about a service the way you feel about the relationship. And because Laura Nero failed to establish a relationship with us, we didn't like the concert and we didn't like her music. You can master all of this. But there's one last thing that you need to do in order to be successful. And I've learned this thing through very painful, yet ultimately very powerful experience. I learned it from being a metastatic breast cancer patient and living what will be 12 years next month to tell my story. I have learned, thank you. I have learned this from leaving a secure job with a salary, benefits, commissions, bonuses, to no real job at all, only a dream I had that I wanted to help cancer patients and their families. I look at these and other critical moments in my life, and I realize that I have come to a place where I feel totally fulfilled a place we all aspire to in our lives and for those of our children. But I've learned that the path to pleasure has been through pain and that it's ultimately all in the risks that we have taken because it's not the ones that you have asked to dance that you will regret. It's the ones that you haven't. Dr. Gail Shahey writes about this phenomenon in her book, Pathfinders when she describes 13 people who she came across who have this quality about them that she coined a sense of high well-being. Dr. Shahi found these 13 people when she was doing the research for her award-winning, groundbreaking book, Passages. And you can only wonder, as Dr. Shahi might have, what do these 13 people have in common? At first, Dr. Shahi thought that the only thing that they had in common was that they had nothing in common. Some were very well educated with advanced degrees. Some had no education at all. Some were quite wealthy and others quite poor. Some were handsome or beautiful and others quite plain. And some had no religious affiliation whatsoever, which might surprise some of you. But then a pattern started to emerge. And it was there in the fourth, and the fifth, and then the sixth, and the seventh. And as an author, I can only imagine Dr. Shahi's anxiety when she took all of the notes of the 13th person, Gordon Mortensen. And she sequestered herself for an entire evening. And she sat down and she was asking herself, will it be there? Will it be here? And it wasn't, and it wasn't, and it wasn't, until she got to within three pages of the end of her notes, and there it was. Gordon Mortensen had told the interviewer, tell Dr. Shahi that when I was 23 years old, I took an enormous risk in my life. The risk was so personal, Dr. Shahi never revealed it. And it's because of this risk that I took that I have come to this place where I feel totally fulfilled, this place that Dr. Shahi calls a sense of high well-being. You play this game with courage. Dr. David Landis also addressed this question in his national award-winning book, The Wealth and Poverty of Nations, when he asked the question, why do some nations thrive when others fail? And Dr. Landis did exhaustive research going back to every single culture, back to ancient Mesopotamia, to the current cultures of today. And in his massive book, you get very few hints as to the differences 
and you really wonder if he's going to answer the question. And there on the last page of his book, he does. It's not guns, germs, or steel, as one author has suggested, that makes the difference between the rich and the poor. It's not natural resources, access to power sources, education, any of the things that you might have read about or believed to be true. The difference in this world is in belief. In this world, the optimists have it. In optimism is everything, revival, transformation, art, renewal. The optimists take the risks that others fail to see. And then he goes on to add, the pessimists only have the lone consolation of knowing that they were failed and that they could say they were right all along. You play this game with courage. So the next time you come to two paths in a road, don't take the path of least resistance. Paths without obstacles rarely go anywhere. Instead, take the road along the cliff, the one without the guardrails, because I can promise you this, that the sheer exhilaration of the ride and the pride that you feel when you finish will fill you with even more pride and give you even more confidence to take even more risks. And that one day will bring you more money, but every day will leave you utterly more fulfilled. Thank you very much.